Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, I'm joined by Pat Ceresna from Big Picture Trading. He's going to talk to us a little bit about the leadership rotation that we've seen recently. We've talked about this sort of indigestion environment, as we uh, as we phrased it uh, previously, the S&P pushing to new all-time highs yet again. It's the growthy stuff leading, but today a little bit more of a cyclical feel to it. Industrials, materials one and two, followed by utilities. So it was not all offense as the S&P making new highs. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a cloudy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we focus on the markets. We focus on the charts. We focus on the message of price. Price arguably represents all known information as reflected by the actions of the uh, composite buyers and sellers all getting together and acting on their emotional reaction to uh, expectations for the financial markets on a day like today, the path of least resistance appears to be higher. The S&P pushing to new all-time highs yet again. But the questions remain in terms of the leadership, in terms of what's actually pushing pushing us up there, right? Recently, as we've seen the S&P moving higher in this last uh, period here in recent weeks, it's been driven by the growthy stuff, the fan mag stocks, the fang stocks, the mega stocks, however you'd want to describe them, these mega cap tech consumer communications names that are pushing higher. Today, a little bit of a different feel to it, a little bit of a mean reversion with cyclicals uh, or some of the cyclical sectors, particularly industrials and materials bouncing uh, a little bit today. So overall, let's talk about the big picture trend with a bit of a focus on breadth today. We have some great guests on this show, including Pat Ceresna from Big Picture Trading joining us a little later today. Tomorrow on July 8th, on Thursday, we have Mark Newton from Newton Advisors. Next week on Tuesday the 13th, we have Larry Tentarelli from Blue Chip Daily. All next week, by the way, is our special mid-year market outlook events called Charting the Second Half. Every day, we'll have some new content for you featuring the expertise of people like Linda Rashke, Tony Dwyer, Gina Martin-Adams, Martin Pring, our own John Murphy. I'll be sharing some of my thoughts as well from conversations with John and others. Uh, and uh, we'll also finish the week with a panel featuring Jay Woods from Drive Wealth, JC Peretz from All Star Charts, and John Kosar from Asbury Research. It should be a lot of fun if you're trying to get your head around this market and think about the next six months. I would encourage you to participate in each of those sessions. For more info and the schedule of everything coming up, go to stockcharts.com slash charting the second half. That's second to ND, charting the second half, and you can get more information on all of the above. Let's continue on with our market recap. So as I mentioned, the S&P making new uh, market highs. Looked like a new closing high. It's pretty close to a couple of days ago, but it appeared to be uh, right about there. So the S&P about a third of a percent higher, finishing just below 4360. Mid caps up just a little bit and small caps actually continuing to underperform down 0.6%. Look at the last couple of weeks, it's been a pretty standard day where you have large caps up, small caps down and mid caps in the, uh, in the middle. The NASDAQ up just a little bit, 0.2% on the NASDAQ 100 and flat for the NASDAQ composite. The VIX is actually down around 16.2. Interest rates continue to uh, go lower with the 10-year yield touching 1.3% earlier today, but settling the day around 132. This is down quite a ways from 175, which is where we were not too long ago. You've certainly seen this rotation higher in bonds with the TLT, the ag up uh, uh, about 0.9% today for the TLT uh, and interest rates coming down. Uh, we had Fed meeting minutes today, but really no significant change in, uh, in the picture that we've seen continues to be lower rates, higher stocks until proven otherwise. The dollar, by the way, up uh, uh, a little bit, but really sold off for, uh, for much of the day, closing just below 25 for the UUP. Elsewhere, we have gold continuing to rally. We talked about the bullish divergence in the chart of gold earlier this week, and that certainly seems to be playing out further. The rest of the commodity complex, for the most part, though, besides silver and copper, was down, and energy the worst of the 11 S&P sectors, one of the few that were actually down on an absolute basis today. Cryptocurrencies in uh, bounce mode and recovery mode of sorts today, with Bitcoin trading higher, about 1.1%, the rest of them up 
uh, sort of a token amount for a pretty volatile asset class of volatility coming off a little bit uh, just recently. You know, looking at a chart of the S&P 500, <clears throat> the S&P has continued to push higher. Every month we've seen higher highs uh, so far year to date uh, as we continue to, uh, to, to, to have this climb uh, upwards and upwards. You know, I've thought about you know, the different feels of this market, the different stages of this rally uh, so far year to date, I, you could almost group it in threes. You have the first one, which is sort of that first quarter, January, February. This is continuing the rally out of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the strong finish in December of last year, pushing higher, but with a couple of meaningful pullbacks along the way. The next phase was the acceleration into the April highs, which was the move uh, upwards. And then once again, we've hit sort of this uh, sort of third phase, which is a repeat of the other ones, the acceleration upwards, the bearish divergence, the pullback uh, sort of environment as we test the 50-day. Second time, we have the acceleration to the upside in April. We have the pullback of about 4 uh, to 5% choppy uh, environment as we alleviate this bearish divergence. We're now rotating to yet another uh, new high. And the question is, is this a repetitive pattern in the third quarter? Is just one more repeat of the same thing. If so, we have uh, higher highs in play uh, or in store as we uh, as we look for a bearish divergence. That sort of very simplistic analog, I think, is uh, is dangerous to uh, to accept that narrative at face value. As always, I would be remaining diligent, looking at stops, looking at when levels are broken. What you're seeing on the S and P as we continue to push higher, the the pattern has been moving to new highs, and on a pullback, we find find support right around the 50-day moving average and we return higher. I don't see anything suggesting that that's going to change uh, until, uh, until, it, until it does, right? So far, we're, we're following this 2021 playbook fairly consistently. We're going to talk a little bit later about uh, breadth indicators, so I don't want to get too deep into it. I know talking with, uh, with Pat Ceresna, my guest before the show, I know we're going to hit a little bit on breadth, and then we're going to focus on a segment called banking on breadth, uh, digging into some of the other things like bullish percent numbers. So we'll, we'll save that for a little bit later in the show. But looking at sectors, you can see that it was some of the cyclicals back to the top here. And this is actually an, an interesting look. Some of these sectors have been, you know, have certainly been in pullback mode, industrials and materials in particular. Uh, you know, yesterday, for example, these are at the bottom of the uh, of the list, but all of a sudden bouncing up today. So the top three sectors as the S&P making new all-time highs is industrials, materials, utilities. Healthcare is number four. And when I'm screening for stocks making new swing highs, which is a common screen that I make, uh, and looking for stocks, uh, you know, basically making a new three-month high, uh, so a new high for the quarter. Found a lot of healthcare in there as I was screening through it uh, earlier this morning. So, you know, while the sector itself has been a relative, uh, you know, relatively weak, even though on a price basis it's appreciated okay, it was one of the few sectors uh, actually making new swing highs recently. Uh, but overall, it's been a it's been a market performer. Really, hasn't been outperforming the market. However, if you look underneath and you look at things like medical supplies, some of the equipment names, even some of the pharmaceutical stocks, you'll find charts that are actually breaking out and outperforming just fine. It's all about which uh, some of the larger stocks in that uh, in that uh, sector that are weighing things down a little bit. On the downside, you have energy. Let's focus on that for a little bit. You know, I've uh, you know talked with some of my guests about. Uh, oil prices, uh, certainly we've had a, a pretty good run in oil prices, but you've seen some of that give back recently and you've seen the XLE now make a lower high, which is what we've potentially seen here in the last couple of weeks. You know, the, the most recent new high was in June, uh, the first couple of weeks in June. Since then, it's been a pattern of lower highs. Now, all of a sudden, we're making a lower swing low, not really on a closing basis just yet, but we're back below the 50-day moving average for the first time since April. So in a sector that had been pretty good leadership. You know, the relative strength had been very, very strong. All of a sudden, it's more in consolidation mode. And now the question is, is it more in uh, corrective mode? And so far, you know, when we're looking back here and we see it hit resistance in March, retest it in May, and then break above it in early June, this feels like it's going to potentially go to the moon and continue to drive higher. So from there, that's been, that's been the high uh, for the uh, for the year, from there it's been more about a retracement, and so overall it's all about whether uh, levels hold. Right now we're trading below the 50-day. We've closed below the 50-day. My question is, do we remain above some of these previous lows? Uh, about 52 was the low uh, just below that in uh, in mid June. 51 was the low from uh, earlier in May. I'll be looking to see if those levels hold. If not, you have to start looking at some deeper pullback uh, potential here and see if there's more of a of a downside potential in a uh, in a key value-oriented sector that had been a top performer uh, up until now. Looking at some other uh, very quick themes here before we, uh, before we uh, continue on, 
as we're looking at some of the, the stocks that are gaining today, uh, Oracle number one, and we haven't talked about the chart of Oracle too often, and this is how quickly things can, can change. When you're looking at Oracle, you saw a stock making new uh, highs in June, and then look at how quickly it came back. And this is where uh, the chart of uh, some of the energy stocks actually looks kind of like this without the gap, it's sort of retracing going below the 50 day and sort of uh, matching with some of these previous lows. From there though, in the last week, you've seen a rotation back higher. We're back to new, uh, we're back to new highs, just entering the overbought condition uh, after come out, coming, uh, coming out of there in a big way in early June. So you have the uh, overbought condition, the gap lower all felt actually pretty weak as it was testing support, but the support is held. And now all of a sudden you have a pattern of higher highs and higher lows, zooming, you know, taking a step back on this chart, the chart of Oracle is actually fairly constructive over the long term, right? As you continue to chip away higher highs and higher lows, anytime a stock becomes overbought, that on its own is not necessarily a negative sign. I always, I always tell people overbought means up a lot. That just means the uptrend has been fairly strong. The question as always is whether, uh, you know, we continue to make higher highs and higher lows. That's a check on the plus column for higher highs. The question is, if and when we see a pullback in Oracle, which we certainly would, do we establish a higher low? That's the key for now. We need to take a quick break. We'll be back with my guest, Pat Ceresna from Big Picture Trading. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close as we try to make sense of these markets together using the power of data visualization, using charts to understand changes in price and breadth and sentiment over time, leaning into what's working, leaning, leaning away from what is not working. As a reminder, uh, we have uh, the ability to answer your questions, and we, uh, we are excited about uh, hearing from you and helping drive you uh, in the right direction or point you in the right direction as much as we can. Our email is the final bar at stockcharts.com. We're on Twitter at final bar SCTV. And we're on YouTube. Just put a comment below any of the videos on our channel. We're going to capture all those questions. We hope to hear from you and answer one of your questions in our next mailbag segment at the end of the week. Also, as a reminder, go to stockchartstv.com, use your email, set up a free account. You can start watching all of our great content from fantastic guests like Pat Ceresna, great hosts and shows like The Final Bar and all of our special events like Charting the Second Half. You can find more info at stockchartstv.com or also on all the app stores. Just search for Stock Charts TV On Demand. I want to welcome on today's guest, Pat Ceresna. Pat's the, uh, coming to us from Big Picture Trading up in Toronto. Also, he's the co-host of two fantastic podcasts, Market Huddle and Macro Voices. Pat, welcome to the show. Good to have you on today. Oh, thank you for having me. So I've described this market as uh, in indigestion mode. We've sort of had this big run up to the highs in April. From there, it's been more rotational, uh, arguably. You're starting us with a long-term chart, looking at the relative performance of the, or the performance trends of some of these different major indexes. How are you seeing the current environment? Well, you know, it, uh, I, I, when we look just on the surface, when someone sees that uh, the performance over the last year, let's say on something like the Russell 2000 small caps, it looks like it materially outperformed, well, has materially outperformed on a year over year basis, the, the green line on there. But uh, really, there has been a, a, a substantial storyline under the surface. So the reflation trade kicked in back in November. Uh, which was driven by a very weak dollar and substantial strength in the cyclicals, uh, led by uh, two particular segments in the market, I think, that were extraordinary, which was the energy sector and the financials. Uh, and they, uh, during that period, uh, the Russell 2000 had an extraordinary run out to February um, and materially outperformed all the other indices. And the NASDAQ remained structurally, uh, you know, uh, range bound and underperformed all the way out until like April or May. Uh, but one of the interesting things that happened uh, in, in April, May, when we had all of these um, big inflation prints come out, uh, and it really started to look like inflation was rearing its big, uh, ugly head. Uh, suddenly, you would think that the cyclicals and all these things would actually be gaining momentum on that. But rather, uh, it, they started to correct. And the rotation started. And really, once the Fed uh, last month uh, uh, kind of gave almost a hawkish tilt, 
uh, we saw everyone get spooked out of this trade and a full on rotation kick in. And that rotation has actually under the surface, when you look under the hood of the market, has actually been pretty ugly. I mean, the leadership has really rotated into, uh, like you were, or you uh, alluded to earlier, the Fang stocks. Uh, I don't, uh, I don't, I call them the Fang, even though Microsoft is supposed to be added to that basket. Uh, but really, they're, uh, they're like the Nasdaq and those Fang stocks are up well over twenty percent in a month. While if you go uh, sector by sector, outside of like healthcare, maybe uh, the discretionary is making a bit of a higher high. Uh, every other sector has fully rotated and rolled over uh, during this period. And, uh, and it's one of the interesting things, like when we go to that second chart and we look at the breadth of the market, um, what we uh, find is, is that the internals are incredibly weak and deteriorating. Uh, in the, uh, and it really is those huge mega cap uh, fang stocks, uh, you know, Facebook, Amazon, um, and uh, Apple and Microsoft and Google that have been uh, just carrying the entire weight of the market higher while broad distribution is happening on the surface. And one of the interesting questions I have, uh, Dave, that I, I'm kind of looking for is, is that in order for the stock market to go next level up, I would uh, speculate that uh, that we want need to see breadth widen and more sectors start to participate because we are quite overbought on those Fang stocks and on the Nasdaq, and one would think that uh, that uh, in the next level higher on the market can it be just alone with those generals, those leadership stocks that are working right now going to next level, or does it need that broader participation? And this is what makes me a little bit nervous about the summer, where we may very well end up seeing the indices get far more range bound uh, in the interim. And I think that these very bullish trends that we're seeing in the NASDAQ and S&P over the last month are, uh, are going to get a little more choppy here and we'll probably end up having a much more quiet summer. You make so many great points there, Pat. And you talked about, you know, obviously we're in the summer months where we're supposed to be in the seasonally weakest part of the year here, right? From sort of May through October. Uh, but we really haven't seen that on the averages, right? The averages continue yeah. to push higher. Where you are seeing it is places like small caps, some of the cyclical sectors that are that are coming uh, that are coming down. Um, you know, and you mentioned the, the breadth picture. You know, clearly becoming less and less robust as as it's a, a smaller group of stocks pushing higher. When you think about you know the the next couple of months here, sort of going into the fall, we're entering into earnings season here very soon. You know, where would you be looking for opportunities? Is it is it in the growthy names? Is it in the things that have been leading recently that are potentially a, sort of a blue chip safe haven of sorts? Or is an opportunity? Is this an opportunity to buy you know good companies at a discount with some of these stocks that are in pullback mode in some of the cyclical sectors? Where where are you looking for opportunities here? I think it's a bigger macro question because uh, what, what really the dollar has turned up and a couple of the commodities uh, have all started to roll over. If we see those trends persist, then I'll be far more interested in buying dips on the FANG uh, stocks uh, uh, when, when they start pulling back toward their averages. Uh, it would really take uh, us going back into the bigger macro conditions we saw back in November, December, and January for me to be buying the dip in the other sectors. I think right now, staying with what's working might end up being the prevailing trend. And that's, I guess, the puzzle piece we're trying to solve here in the coming uh, month, isn't it? It absolutely is. We only have about 30 seconds left, Pat, but you are in Canada, so I have to ask about gold. Uh, this is a commodity, obviously, that had a pretty good run, but has been in, in pullback mode as, you know, the FANG stocks and the growth growth trade has worked. As, as inflation concern, concerns have appeared to evaporate, you've seen gold come off. Is this an opportunity to be getting into gold at a relatively weaker level? What, do you, what's your, what are you seeing with gold going well, forward? Right now, there was a little bit of pressure on real yields that drove that short-term move. Uh, I'm still in bigger picture, uh, bullish gold. And even, even if we see, I mean, certainly I think inflation hit the upper boundaries of some short-term uh, where we'll see the rate of change really curtail uh, on that, which could kind of keep things a, a little bit uh, muddy over the next month. But I'm, I am definitely buying dips on gold. Uh, the bigger question is, can we get above like the FIB levels and around the 1850 area? I'm rounding, obviously, but will we be able to see them build momentum or is there another leg in this correction that will kind of push things out to the, the seasonal kind of periods in the in, towards the fourth quarter? And that's uh, something uh, that uh, well, one way or another, I think it will, there'll be a great buy on dip opportunity here. It's just about timing it a little bit. 
it's a fantastic take. I appreciate you bringing some charts with you, answering my questions. Be well, stay safe. We'll talk to you again soon. Thank you very much, Dave. That's Pat Ceresna. Pat's the uh, coming to us from Big Picture Trading up in Toronto. He's the co-host of the Market Huddle podcast. I'm actually going to be, be appearing on his podcast uh, very soon. Uh, so I look forward to uh, talking with him in uh, more more detail there. He does a great job, and I love his just his uh, his 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 view that very simple but powerful chart that we started with, just showing the trend in the Russell. And you know, when people talk about what's working and what isn't, you know, it always is about your time frame. When people tell me, you know, ask me what's working and what isn't, my question is, what's your time frame? If you're looking at the last year, it appears that the Russell 2000 has been the juice. It's been what's driving things. But if you look really at the most recent move, you can sense that rotation. You can see how the Russell 2000 has stalled uh, and you can see how, uh, you know, the other index is really recovering as it's, as it's other parts of the market that are really pushing uh, their way higher. That was a, was a great take and some, uh, some great visuals. Let's continue on. Our next segment is called Banking on Breath. What we love to do is focus on some of the breath conditions. I, I love Pat's take on uh, the, the breath, in particular, uh, illustrating that uh, the weakening breath characteristics using the percent of stocks above their 50-day moving average. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the other breath conditions uh, as well. And I think there's a very similar theme to what uh, to that, what Pat was suggesting. Uh, you know, when you think about breath, I think about a couple of different things. For me, it's advanced or decliners. It's new highs and new lows. It's uh, stocks above and below their moving averages, and it's uh, it's the bullish percent indexes. Let's go through each of those very quickly and just see what they're telling us right now. When I'm looking at the cumulative advanced decline lines, again, the way that I look at it is sort of this standard chart. This is part of our Mindful Investor Live chart list, by the way. If you want access to this, all Stock Charts members can access it as part of their membership. Go, just go to the Articles tab at the top. Go to my homepage, which is called the Mindful Investor. You'll see a gray button at the top that says Live Chart List. That'll get you to all of the charts that we're going to show here in a moment. Um, the S&P Advanced Decline Line has made new highs uh, in the last week. And what that basically is, is it's saying every day how many stocks within the S&P, how many of the S&P members are advancing on the day, closing above yesterday's close or declining on the day. It's taking a, an aggregate uh, number there of those two and then adding it to a running total or subtracting it from a running total over time. That's how you get a cumulative advanced decline line. So it's logical that as the S&P would be going higher, that more, uh, you know, more stocks on an average day on average over time would be closing higher versus lower. That's kind of how the index would most likely move upwards. And that's why you're seeing it. But if you look at all the other cap tiers, they have not confirmed the new high recently. If you look at the NYSE common stock only, so it's a much broader universe, it's actually making a lower high in the last week. If you look at the mid cap index, the small cap index, all of them have failed to make a new high after the first week in June. So while the S&P on a closing basis has gone to new highs, while the advanced decline line using the S&P members has broken out, all the other cap tiers have gone down. Now, again, you have to remember these are equal weighted measures of advancers versus decliners. Every stock has an equal weight. The S&P index itself is a cap weighted index. So the mega cap stocks that have really been driving things are pushing the market higher. And that's what that series of lines is essentially going to show you is the uh, is the now, the fact that it's been the large caps, really the mega caps that have driven higher, all the other cap tiers are still more, are actually more in consolidation mode. I wouldn't say correction mode just yet, but more consolidation mode. Second chart would be new highs and new lows. And, uh, you know, Pat had mentioned earlier about, uh, you know, a healthy market. I'm paraphrasing Pat's comments, but something about, you know, the market's going higher, you should see uh, an expansion in breadth or improvement in breadth, which is absolutely right. A healthy bull market phase sees an expansion in breadth indicators. You want more stocks going higher than going lower. You want more stocks trading above key moving averages. And you want a healthy number of stocks making new 52-week highs. But if you look at what's happened May to June to July, every month so far, we've seen less and less stocks making new 52-week uh, highs. The two panels at the bottom here, this is the S&P uh, at the top. The second uh, panel down here is the percent, I'm sorry, the number of stocks in the New York Stock Exchange making new highs or new lows. Uh, the bottom panel is the same measure, but for the S&P 500, you can see there's the big spike in April accelerating into May. That's when many, many stocks were making uh, new 52-week highs. At this point, sort of the highest day, it was about 45%, almost half of the S&P 500 making a 52-week high on the same day. Look at what's happened since then, and it's been much, much less, right? Every new high uh, here in June and so far in July, you've had less and less stocks making new 52-week highs. That is absolutely something to be looking at because 
a, a positive, a constructive market environment would be the S&P going to the upside. And what we saw sort of late March to early April, which is an increasing number of stocks making new 52-week highs. That tells you it's not just the mega cap names that are doing it. It's more and more stocks that are able to eclipse their own highs from earlier in the year. We're just maybe starting to see that in the last week or two. And then a continued increase in those new highs would be something I would be looking for uh, on that chart that we really have not seen yet. This is my version of the chart that Pat showed, and I thought he described it uh, beautifully, which is you know, the fact that at this point, as the S&P is making new highs, as the S&P is well above its 50-day moving average, about half of the S&P, just under half actually, can say the same, uh, being uh, above their 50-day moving average. So uh, most stocks in the S&P as, uh, as of Tuesday's close are trading below their 50-day moving average. So not only are they not making new highs, they're not even above their 50-day moving average. So while the S&P has tested it and not broken it, many stocks in the S&P have actually broken below their 50-day and have not been able to, re to recover at that. Now, a lot of those obviously are the cyclical sectors, things like energy and financials, which had been making new highs earlier in the year and have not been able to get back up to those uh, previous levels. But again, my question is the sustainability of a rally when it's um, you know many, many stocks not participating in that up move. For me, a healthy bull market environment means a healthy number of stocks are making new 52-week highs. That leaves us with our last chart, the bullish percent index. And at this point, it's less than 70%. It's actually called a uh, bear alert, where you have a, a, you know, over 70% of, uh, of, uh, of an index above, uh, I'm sorry, in a bullish uh, a configuration using point and figure charts that's actually back below 70, which tells you that using the point and figure methodology, some of the names have actually broken and are now turning uh, more to a sell configuration, a sell signal breaking below their previous uh, swing lows. That's a concern. As long as that remains above 70%, that's not what I would describe as, uh, as healthy. The real warning, by the way, happens when this would be, be below 50%. That's what you look for when the market starts to pull back. At this point, it's more in an alert mode and what tells you to be cautious than super negative. So as we're looking at these uh, breadth indicators, you know, again, for me, my concern is it's, it's not that they're climactically negative. They're just certainly not confirming the recent highs that we've seen in the S&P. And the S&P going higher with less and less constructive breadth is just telling me to be more cautious, to be skeptical of uh, the potential for upside, to be looking for risk levels and making sure that you manage uh, and, and protect the downside effectively. We need to wrap the show, go to the three and three. Three charts in three minutes. Here we go. In our segment, Banking on Breadth, we talked about the bullish percent index and how uh, the breadth indicators overall have become a little less uh, constructive. This is a chart I would use to track whether we see further deterioration. We talked about only about 50%, a little less than that in the S&P above their 50-day. We currently have around 67 68% of the S&P that are still in a bullish point and figure chart, which means about a third of them are actually in a sell signal right now. You know, the market pulling back or the market going higher as less and less stocks are in a bullish point figure chart tells you there's some warning signs underneath the hood that may not be as obvious looking at the uh, high level indexes. Chart number two is the energy sector. We're using the XLE here. This is a, I think, a perfect illustration of this leadership rotation we've had. If you look at the first week in June, you have a sector making new price highs. You have the RSI you know, increasing, but not necessarily overextended. You have the relative strength starting to improve. This looks like a very constructive chart and a very constructive breakout. From there, it's been nothing but, uh, but sort of consolidation. I don't, wouldn't say this is necessarily breaking down just yet, but it's really close to where I would describe it. It has broken the 50-day. That is step one. I would be eyeing some of these previous lows, in particular around 51, which is the low from May. I think it would be a really interesting tell on the energy sector. Finally, this is my public service announcement. In any environment, regardless of what the S&P is doing, I'm always uh, often able to find stocks making new swing highs and stocks making new swing lows. As I'm screening for new swing lows, I'm seeing a healthier, healthier number, uh, an increasing number of stocks making new swing lows. I think that's a tell as well. At times, there's all, been only a handful of stocks uh, in my uh, in my universe that are breaking down. Now I'm seeing more and more than Pinduo Duo PDD, which is a Chinese uh, consumer discretionary stock. You can see it breaking below its moving averages and now breaking down through price support as well. Folks, that is our show for today. Special thank you to Pat Ceresna from Big Picture Trading joining us from uh, Toronto. For everyone at Stock Charts TV, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe, be well, have a good night. 
Hey, Grayson Rhodes here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.